One claims it's the company's only chance for survival. Atari has filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. The 31 year old. EWA presents the difference. Kodak is filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. What's up guys, my name is Jake and welcome to the 20th episode of Bankrupt. The cruise industry is often a high margin, fast growing category of the leisure segment. And throughout the history of cruising, there have only been a handful of companies that have gone bankrupt. I've talked about a few of them on this show, like Premier and Crystal. But during the pandemic, another line based in Europe also met an abrupt end. While it was a cruise line partially owned by Royal Caribbean, the second largest cruise line in the world, the pandemic sealed its downfall with its entire fleet ending up in the breaker yards. It provided some truly surreal images of these modern ships being torn apart. So let's find out what happened here, and what led to the catastrophic corporate collapse of Pulmenter Cruises. This episode of Bankrupt is sponsored by Nebula. Get 40% off an annual subscription by going to nebula.tv slash brightsunfilms. It began in Spain in the mid-1990s with a small travel tour company. It was called Pulmenter, and they were ironically working with Premier Cruise Lines over in America, chartering one of their ships called the Sea Wind Crown. They were sailing it in the Mediterranean, and were actually caught up in the bankruptcy of Premier in the year 2000, with the ship they had been chartering being seized by authority. But Pulmenter took advantage of Premier's downfall, as all of their ships were being liquidated at huge discounts. Suddenly, their aspirations were more than just a touring company that leases ships. They wanted to be an actual cruise line that takes advantage of the quickly growing Mediterranean market. So the newly named Pullmanter Cruises purchased the former flagship of Premier, the former Big Red Boat, and renamed it to its original name, the Oceanic. Following a short refurbishment, they put their new ship into service by May of 2001. They did so with a new white livery complemented by a blue funnel and the red Pullmanter Cruises script on the hull. The Oceanic turned out to be a popular ship and generated a healthy profit, so much so that the cruise line was ready for expansion. They took on another ship, the SS Pacific, formerly of the Princess Line. There's actually a great photo of the Pacific and the Oceanic from the early 1970s, of both of them in the New York Harbor together, and now they were once again paired in the Pullmanter fleet. A few other ships would join them through the next few years, either being charted or bought out entirely by the cruise line. The company also introduced their own airline, starting with a fleet of two 747s. By 2005, the line was Spain's fastest growing cruise line, and one of the largest cruise companies appealing to Spanish-speaking passengers sailing in Europe. Despite all of their ships being much older than other lines, their customer base was fast growing and their profit margins were very healthy. In fact, Pulmenter was capturing nearly 36% of the entire Spanish-speaking market with an annual growth rate of 25%. It was a very promising cruise line, and other companies took notice, one of them being the American cruise giant Royal Caribbean. They were the second largest cruise line in the world, and they wanted into this market. So, in summer of 2006, Royal Caribbean International announced their acquisition of Pullmanter Cruises. The deal would be completed later that year, and Pullmanter became Royal Caribbean's first wholly owned subsidiary brand outside of the US. They acquired the entire company for around 430 million euro, which is around 715 million dollars today, converted and adjusted for inflation. They would also assume all of their debt another 300 million euros worth, so the entire deal was close to a billion dollars. The deal was exciting as Royal Caribbean was a powerhouse in the industry, and this acquisition could see the company build their very own ships, something that had already been rumored. In 2007, the changes within the company were already apparent. Royal Caribbean began transferring some of their ships from their other lines over to Pullmanter. The company would also continue to bring older ships outside of the Royal Caribbean fleet into theirs, sometimes turning around a vessel acquisition within a year like the MS Oceanic 2. By 2008, however, the line narrowed their fleet image, retiring most of their older ships. From this point on, it seemed that Royal Caribbean was positioning Pullmanter as a cruise line that was geared to utilizing older ships that offered budget-friendly voyages. 
Caribbeans. So they began using the line as a place to transfer Royal Caribbean's retired vessels from their main fleet. Some of those included Empress of the Seas, Sovereign of the Seas, as well as the Celebrity Horizon. Now, in Pullmanter's eyes, these were comparatively modern ships from what they had been sailing before, and the cruise line continued their rise in the European market. They also introduced a subsidiary brand called CDF, which was a brand created to appeal to the French market and would operate ships out of France, though it would really only last a few years. Pullmanter Cruises continued to operate their voyages in the Spanish market, in many cases offering all-inclusive deals across their fleet. They also expanded their reach, sailing to destinations not only all over Europe, but to the Caribbean and South America too, capitalizing on the Spanish-speaking populations of Colombia, Panama, and Brazil. Their cruises captured a loyal but smaller fan base there, with many agreeing with the company's marketing that they were high in value and in quality. Many praised the crew members, the decently cheap fares, and the fact that it was all-inclusive. The ships weren't the most modern or the most flashy, but they were well taken care of, and because they originated from Royal Caribbean and Celebrity, they were higher quality than other budget lines in Latin America and Spain. By 2012, the company updated their brand image across the board, introducing new liveries for their cruise ships and their airline fleet, which was now up to four jumbo jets. Over the next few years, the strategy Pullmanter had been implementing wasn't exactly paying off. While initial projections were compelling that the positioning of the brand around Latin American countries would see significant growth, in reality, it was a lot more volatile. They weren't seeing the same amount of growth they had experienced in Spain, and their larger ships just weren't filling up. It also didn't help that the Brazilian real, the primary currency in the country, had devalued over 20% in just a year. This resulted in the company repositioning their fleet back to their core market of Spain, and reducing their total number of ships. Royal Caribbean would transfer Empress back to their mainline fleets, and cancel the planned flag change of Majesty of the Sea. A restructuring of the company was well underway, divesting stakes in other divisions that were seen as non-core businesses outside of the cruise market. Clearly, Pullmanter wasn't the massive success it was seen from the outside, and Royal Caribbean apparently didn't want to be left holding the bag. In 2016, they sold 51% of their stake in the company to an investment firm called Springwater Capital, the same company which they had just sold their non-core businesses to. Royal Caribbean would continue to own a 49% stake of the company, but obviously not the controlling shares. For the next few years, it seemed as though the company as a whole was not performing like it used to. That was in stark contrast to their part owner, Royal Caribbean, as by the end of 2019, they had brought in nearly $11 billion dollars, with almost $2 billion of that being profit. Pullmanter was clearly nowhere near that. Then the pandemic hit. The cruise industry was one of the most hard hit, as social distancing was enforced around the world. Cruise ships are naturally tight spaces and bubbles of close contact populations, so they were obviously not able to operate as normal. Every cruise line, including Pullmanter, was shut down and put on hold, really with no sign of an immediate end. While their ships were standing by, more than half the crew on the Zenith had tested positive for COVID-19, a major disease spreading event. By June 2020, the company announced they would be suspending all operations until at least November of that year. In the meantime, they would cold lay up their ships. That basically meant the ships would be docked with limited to no crew, with all of its electronic systems shut down. Basically, a long-term storage solution. But the effects of the worldwide shutdown were far more devastating than originally thought. The company was already in debt from their years of paying off new ship acquisitions, and after the last few years of poor sales and a limited market to draw from, the company was only just hanging on. When everything abruptly shut down, the cruise line had no way to meet debt payment obligations, and quickly ran through their liquid cash. They now had massive cruise ships requiring hundreds of thousands, even millions of dollars in operational fees, with almost no revenue coming through the door. Just days after their announcement of suspended operations, the company also announced they had filed for reorganization, and a month after that, declared bankruptcy altogether. At the time of this bankruptcy, the cruise line had four ships, the Zenith, Horizon, Sovereign, and Monarch. While this seemed like a death blow for the entire company, it wasn't touted as such, with the leadership confident they would find the cash to restart. 
left. Their company morale was staying strong too, posting videos like this on YouTube, dancing to the song, I Will Survive. But their existing fleet was just sitting idle, but rumors began spreading that they were being gutted to extract all items of value. This didn't look great, and seemed more like the company was desperate for cash. By the summer of 2020 though, Polinter announced they had sold two of their ships for scrap. Not long after, the Monarch and Sovereign were beached on the shores of a scrapyard in Aliaga, Turkey. Shortly after, they began to be torn apart. The two Pullmanter ships were grounded along a short stretch of beach right beside each other, along with three other Carnival cruise ships. The whole scene was completely surreal, especially for ships that were really not that old in their operating life, and now were figuratively and literally destroyed by the detrimental situation across the world. By December 2020, Royal Caribbean agreed to provide funding for Pulmenter for their reorganization, and that could include the restructuring of their fleet and the experience they provide. But the images coming from Turkey showing half their fleet being dismantled wasn't exactly cause for hope. This left the cruise line with two remaining ships, and by 2021, the cruise industry had more or less restarted. Pullmanter, however, didn't follow suit, and failed to find enough cash to get a proper restart of operations. There were many talks on just how and when the company would restart their operations, but as timelines came and went, their remaining ships sat idle. Royal Caribbean just wasn't in a position to inject any more cash, and while the cruise line was in talks with new investors, they apparently didn't go anywhere. The cruise line was still millions of euros in debt, and while the rest of the industry was moving on, Pullmanter decided to pull the plug. They announced instead of restarting, they would liquidate everything. By the following year, both remaining ships in the fleet were sold for scrap and sent to Alang, India. This marked the end of the brand's physical presence in the cruise market, and basically the death of the entire company. In February of 2023, the last remnants of the cruise line were sold off, mainly the name itself, Pullmanter. It was auctioned off with a starting bid of 177,000 euros. As of today, all of the ships the company ended with have now been scrapped and no longer exist, and the majority of their legacy fleet had also met a similar fate. Just three of their former ships are still in operation today, two of them being with Azamara Cruises and the remaining one with Oceania Cruises. In the end, Pulmenter was both a success and a failure. The early rise showed a lot of promise in this tiny little tour company that had managed to build a proper cruise line, as well as an airline, from almost nothing. There was so much promise that they caught the attention of one of the largest leisure companies in the world. But it turned out that the Spanish market really couldn't sustain a larger line, and they found that out the hard way in Latin America. Their rocky financial position proved to be not strong enough when the pandemic forced their shutdown. Without any new builds or bespoke ships of their own, the company just wasn't seen as a wise investment. They were a cruise line that essentially operated previously built cruise ships from other lines, and I can understand why many didn't see value in keeping the brand alive. Even their own multi-billion dollar parent company agreed with that sentiment. That left them with no options but bankruptcy, and inevitably put them into a very unique club of failed cruise lines. As you may know, I love the history of how engineering projects came to be, whether that's on the ocean or in the sky. I recently just checked out Mustard's Nebula original on the B-2 bomber, how and why it was developed. I've always been a fan of Mustard's videos, and this was a fascinating look at the geopolitical and technical circumstances that led to its creation as one of the most sophisticated and expensive flying machines in existence. Of course, since this is a Nebula original, it can only be found on Nebula. Nebula is a creator-made and creator-run platform where you can find high-quality original shows from your favorite online creators. Brights and Films is of course also there with all of my videos ad-free and released a few days before they do here on YouTube. Additionally, there's also Nebula Classes, a collection of unique, high-quality courses to learn from your favorite content creators. All of this is included with a Nebula subscription, and if you want to get 40% off an annual subscription for yourself, 
you can use my special link nebula.tv slash brightsunfilms. That link will also be in the description below. Using my link will get you a subscription that comes out to just a little over $2.50 a month. Anyway guys, my name is Jake, and thank you very much for watching.